October 1924, Bayway, New Jersey. 49 workers at the Ethel Corporation's oil refinery experienced strange symptoms of insanity and moral sickness after the Ethel Corporation introduces a new kind of gasoline containing lead. A New Jersey medical examiner determines the cause of death to be lead poisoning. Over the next few weeks, various cities in New York and New Jersey banned the production and use of tetraethyl gasoline. Standard Oil admits that there are perils with working with lead, but denies that they exist when simply burning it in oil. They managed to overturn the bans on lead and resume production, albeit with new safety measures. The matter was dropped for another 42 years, until a little-known scientist stumbled upon the hidden effects of a silent killer. Lead, a heavy metal that occurs naturally within the crust of the earth. It can be used as a pure metal, made into an alloy, or even used in chemical compounds with examples ranging throughout history from car batteries to ceramic lasers to Roman wine flavoring. It has, due to its wide array of uses, been mass refined by countries the world over. The United States of America alone produced over 1 million tons of lead in 2015, and yet is only the third biggest producer in the world. However, humans have known for many centuries that lead is poisonous to living organisms. When lead is introduced to the body, cells mistake it for nutrients and are poisoned when they absorb it. In addition, it blocks up nerve passages and damages the brain. It results in malformation in fetuses and causes cancer. There has even been a proven causal link between lead in children and a decrease in IQ. For children, the CDC recommends that 5 micrograms per deciliter of blood should be cause for concern. Even so, not many gave it much thought when it was added to gasoline to prevent engine knocking. Not many, that is, until a geochemist realized the extent of lead pollution from gasoline and managed to present his findings in front of the United States Senate. Claire Cameron Patterson, in a seemingly unrelated event, set out to officially date the Earth. To do so, he used meteor fragments from the early formation of the Earth called zircons by measuring the ratio of uranium to lead that was inside them, and therefore the amount of uranium that had decayed he could find out when they had formed, and in doing so, when the Earth formed. Dr. Patterson was to measure the amounts of lead, while George Tilton, a fellow graduate student, assisted him by measuring the uranium in the zircons. Though this seemed fairly straightforward, Patterson's results were widely different from each other, whereas Tilton's were regular. The only reason for this, he concluded, was contamination from the outside environment. To fix this, Dr. Patterson did what no one had done before, he created an environment devoid of contaminants that he called the clean room. All surfaces were sanitized, all occupants wore plastic suits, and all traces of lead were removed. When Dr. Patterson carried out his tests here, he was finally able to produce an accurate date of the zircons, 4.5 billion years of age. Dr. Patterson started to receive funding from the Ethel Corporation after he published these findings, the reason for which was the fact that he had done so much with the lead while finding the date of the Earth. The Ethel Corporation's genesis was a patent for leaded gasoline. Leaded gasoline took care of one of the major problems in the engines of that time period, knocking. Engine knocking occurs when a small pocket of air mixed with fuel is ignited by a spark in the combustion chamber, creating a pinging sound which also damages the engine. General Motors and Standard Oil both owned a patent on leaded gasoline, which has a high enough octane to prevent engine knocking. The Ethel Corporation was a solution to their joint possession each company possessing a 50% stake in this budding and prosperous company. Dr. Patterson used this new influx of money from the Ethel Corporation to continue studying lead, and his research led to him examining the ocean. Like many other people, the research of the Ethel Corporation made him believe that the lead contamination was natural. Patterson thought that the best way to find out if Ethel was correct would be to measure the lead levels in the ocean. He took measurements on the lead within it, which produced surprising results. Large amounts of lead were found on the ocean's surface, but very little in its depths. Over periods of time, it would eventually have mixed in with the rest of the ocean to form an equilibrium. Because this had not yet happened, it meant that the lead had been released recently. Dr. Patterson set out to discover what could possibly be producing that much lead so quickly. The answer, it seemed, was right in front of him. Leaded gasoline was pumping lead exhaust into the air at alarming rates, accounting for the layer Dr. Patterson had found in the oceans. 
After releasing his data, the Ethel Corporation offered him a high-paying position if he would release more favorable findings. However, Dr. Patterson refused and was forced to go up against the company that had once funded him. Ethel had either been doing their own studies for decades or silenced most any who dared oppose them. However, their own studies were often biased to the company's interests, at one point stating that the public's danger from inhaling lead exhaust was seemingly remote. However, the entire scientific community decried the study, as it did not adequately mirror reality. Aware of this, and wanting to do something about the pollution, Patterson got in contact with Senator Edmund S. Muskie, with the hopes of adding an amendment to the Clean Air Act. In 1966, he got his meeting with the Senate, but was opposed by a Dr. Kehoe, who testified against Dr. Patterson as a scientific figure on behalf of the Ethel Corporation. Robert A. Kehoe was hired by General Motors in 1924 to study the health effects of tetraethyl lead, and in the following year he became the chief medical advisor of the Ethel Corporation, a position he maintained until his retirement. Between 1924 and 1926, he had played a major role in overturning a ban on leaded gasoline in the northeastern corner of the United States, which had been enacted after many workers at a lead plant in New Jersey had either died or developed mental problems. Kehoe would remove the workers if their blood lead levels reached 60 micrograms per 100 grams of blood, over two times the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's present-day recommended lead levels. It was with Kehoe's help that the lead industry were able to self-regulate and it was him who ran many of the studies. Though Kehoe did not dispute the raw data, in fact he even agreed with the numbers that Patterson put forth regarding lead exposure in factory workers, he claimed that they could withstand more contamination than Patterson stated. Despite Kehoe's presence, and Patterson's absences due to ongoing Arctic studies, he argued his case, and the Clean Air Act of 1970 was written. It forced car companies to put platinum catalysts in the cars so as to limit the pollutants cars expelled. Lead damaged these catalysts, and thus was phased out of gasoline. Because Patterson had taken a stand, a year after he died, lead was banned in armored vehicles once and for all. Patterson had estimated that the lead levels in humans were 1,200 times higher than they were before the Industrial Revolution. After lead was banned, lead levels quickly went down to only 10 to 100 times as high as they originally were. Ethel had once tried to dismiss him as a zealot and a rabble-rouser, but they could not have been further from the truth. He did his best to stay out of the limelight, even putting the names of his students before his on the papers he published. As was best put by his son, Charles Patterson, he was a scientist in the purest sense, being dedicated to the pursuit of truth. Claire Cameron Patterson was an important person, both for his scientific discoveries and for standing up to multi-billion dollar oil companies. He took a stand for what he believed in, which was scientific integrity, that eventually led him taking a stand against a corporation that had already proven it was able to evade any and all criticisms. In the end, he won, though his name has been forgotten by many, and few are aware of his effects on society. Today, the Ethel Corporation still exists, and now complies with the Clean Air Act standards. After the banning of leaded gasoline, lead in individuals dropped remarkably. However, Dr. Kehoe, and by extension the Ethel Corporation, were the cause of a consequence that is arguably worse than lead in the environment. They were the source of a growing distrust in both scientists and the work they do. Thankfully, as an offset to such a calamity, Dr. Patterson's legacy is one of truth and perseverance, of determination and impartiality, of honesty and scientific integrity, no matter who you must stand up against.